Hey there, welcome to episode 42 of Money Never Sleeps, a podcast that looks inside the head of entrepreneurs and at what makes them do what they do. I'm Pete Townsend, your co-host of Money Never Sleeps, along with the larger-than-life Owen Fitzgerald. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is kindly sponsored by Ireland's fintech and financial services recruitment specialist, top-tier recruitment. If you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, we highly recommend you have a chat with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com and tell them we sent you. I've known Sean since he and I were introduced by Tony Winters here in Dublin last year. Shout out to Tony and Lemming Chain. And Owen got to know Sean round about the same time last year. We've been nagging Sean to come on to the show since last year, but he was way too deep in stealth mode to tell us much besides a few good jokes. But now he's ready to open up a bit more about what he's up to. So away we go with episode 42 of Money Never Sleeps. Here we go again. Welcome to Money Never Sleeps. We're here in WeWork Dublin Landings in the offices of our sponsor, Top Tier Recruitment. I'm Pete Townsend. And I'm Owen Fitzgerald. And we're on with Sean Fawnen, CEO of Project Salmon, which we'll unpack a little bit today. Welcome to the show, Sean. Hey, guys. Glad to be here. Thank you. So we all know each other well enough at this stage, Sean. So how about you just give us a little bit of a history lesson on how you got to this point in your life and what you're up to right now? Oh, my God. Talk about uh, starting off with a small question. A little tiny bit. <laughs> a of little, little tiny question. I, I think the, the genesis of what I'm working on uh, at the moment is, is just about a year ago, not, not long before I, I met you, Pete. And then myself and some friends were sitting around and we were talking, as you do, about the banking industry. And we were also talking about what platform companies were doing in other industries. The big tech, the, you know, the Netflixes, the Amazons, the Ubers. And the question arose, how would you bring the methodology, the, the approach, the process of a big tech company to banking? Mm -hmm. So our first thought was, well, someone must have done this already. And it had been half done in a sense of there's a very interesting company in Asia called WeChat. And obviously, as you know, what WeChat has done is they've created a super app where people can basically access a whole range of services, financial and non-financial. And we looked at that and we thought, this is really cool. Who's doing it in the West? And the answer was no one. And so it was like, well, why don't we do it? And that's the genesis of Project Salmon. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, your, you know, your background, I know um, we've talked about investment banking before. We've talked a little bit about media before. You may want to just uh, share a bit of that for our listeners? Yeah, I have um, a rather peculiar CV. Okay. Um, and, you know, in retrospect, I can explain to you how one step inevitably led to another. Yeah. In practice, as we all know, that's not how it works. Yeah. Um, so when I started, did I expect to be here? No. Um, but am I very glad about how it has developed? Yes. And I think that's one of the things I've, I've learned in the process, be open to opportunities. Mm -hmm. So actually, I started off life as, uh, as an academic. So I have a, a, a BA in economics and history, then went on to do a master's in history, and then I did a, a PhD in history in, in Cambridge. I didn't know you did a PhD yeah, as well. Yeah, I did. Okay. I, I kind of keep it hidden. He liked to be a student. He never wanted to work. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so essentially what that means, guys, by the time I was 28, I'd never really worked. Okay. I was the eternal student. And I have to tell you, it was great. Yeah, it yeah. was absolutely great. But I did come to that point where I had to uh, make a decision. You know, do I follow the traditional academic route, which was, you know, go do a fellowship, get some temporary lectureships, get tenure? And what happened one day, I was sitting in the common room of one of the Cambridge colleges, which I will not name. I looked around at the collection of worthies who surrounded me and just went, no. Yeah. <laughs> this you don't is want not, to be that This guy. is not where I want to end up. I perfectly understand people who, who do because it's a fantastic life. Um, and honestly, it wasn't really the answer I wanted at the time. Having put in all that effort to get to that point, the last thing I wanted to think was, Time for a change. Yeah. Uh, but once I had done that, the question was, you know, what do I change to? Uh, because there are many benefits to having done, you know, postgraduate work in history, but it doesn't actually prepare you for any specific career. 
So what I did was I looked around for a career where one, um, it's not going to be based on seniority because any career based on seniority, I was always going to be way behind. Yeah. And two, where people might be willing to take a punt on someone with a somewhat different background. And much to my own surprise, uh, the company who basically decided to take that punt was J.P. Morgan. Okay. And so after my academic side, my next step was into investment banking. Okay. And I can honestly say the first time I actually opened the Financial Times was on the day I was going for the interview. I was going to say, J.P. Morgan. <laughs> how did you feel about that? Well, I think one of the things that had impressed me particularly about the American investment banks is that they had adopted a very different approach to, for instance, the UK merchant banks. The UK merchant banks typically wanted someone with a very set career path, certain schools, certain colleges. The US investment banks, which is one of the reasons why they're dominant now, their only question was, do we like the person and do they have a brain? Mm -hmm. And can we then, if you like, shape them? Mm -hmm. So if you like, the pitch to me from them was, it doesn't matter what you've done before, we can give you the training that you need. You just need to persuade us that you're the right person for us to spend all that resources on. Okay. So actually when we went in for the, the interviews, et cetera, because I'd begun to understand how they thought, I was actually feeling pretty comfortable. I felt there was something I could offer, and I felt that they, in turn, could take my ignorance and turn it into something of value. Okay. Do you think there's a parallel there between reading and analyzing and understanding history as a means to say, I'm looking at a bunch of facts here, things that happen, and try to interpret them as perhaps being somewhat predictive of what could happen going forward in the way that you would look at perhaps a business um, and say, how have things gone down in the past? Um, how might they uh, take place going forward? Without a doubt, right? So when I, when I went training, uh, J.P. Morgan had this thing called uh, the training program where you basically went and you trained for a number of months in, in their Wall Street office. And they would bring in lecturers, you know, some of whom were doing the Harvard MBA, et cetera. And I was surrounded by people who had done internships, who had done degrees in economics, who actually had perhaps been in other banks and were making a change. And I remember talking to uh, another oldie, because of course we were older than the average intake, and saying, God, you know, how are we going to compete with all of these young Turks, these young lions? They know so much more than us. And he, being much, much wiser to me, said, don't worry about it that experience is going to kick in. Mm -hmm. And that's what you found is, firstly, yes, we didn't have as much financial experience, but we had a bit more experience of life. Yeah. And you very quickly learn in any business, once you have the specifics of the business, that's no longer important. It's how you can work with other people and it's how you could plan. But what I found particularly was that one of the skills that is often underrated is the ability to write. Yeah. The ability to take something very complex and reduce it to something mm. that's understandable. And so not surprisingly, as I worked my way through the JP Morgan training program, you know, I didn't find myself working on the floor or doing quantitative analysis. Surprise, surprise, I became an analyst. Yep. And as an analyst, it was basically taking a whole bunch of data, deciding what was important and writing it in a way that people could understand. And could I have done that without the academic background? No, no, no. And how long did that go on for? So basically I was in investment banking for just under 10 years. And I had basically made a, a vow to myself that I would leave investment banking before I was 40. Okay. Uh, and the reason is really simple is that the life is too attractive. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, there's a buzz to it. It's very well paid. You're meeting incredible people. And so therefore, it would be very easy to be in a situation where, you know, you're in your 50s and you look back and all you've done was investment banking. Yeah. 
And frankly, the longer you stay in, the harder it is to, to get out. So my decision was I'm going to leave before I was 40. So I was at JP Morgan, I was at Credit Suisse, and then I was at Goldman. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I did. Okay. And uh, I went and I gave in, I, was, I think Credit Suisse was the last one, I gave in my, my papers. So people were shocked. Because I'd actually just gone through a really, probably the best patch in my career. Mm -hmm. So no one expected this. And then people asked me, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. And they went, ah, yeah, he's setting up a hedge fund. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) right. of course. So so I got, you know, the business cards and give me a call when you're ready, etc. And after a while, you know, I stopped denying it because the more I denied it, the more people thought I was... Believed it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but literally, I had no idea what I was going to do. Okay. And that was actually the whole purpose of it. Not to have something that was a logical next yeah. step, was to take a break, look around and see what was out there. Gotcha. And what did you do? <laughs> I went to a screenwriting class. Yeah. I think I remember this. Yeah. So my, 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 my wife, uh, um, Jessica, who we met in, uh, met in, met in Cambridge, um, as well as being a great academic, also wrote plays. Mm-hmm. And so I was really interested in what she was doing. But the theatre was never something that hugely attracted me. Uh, you know, I enjoy a play every now and then, but I don't live and breathe it like Jessica did. But I really, really liked movies. Uh, so um, I went to a screenwriting class mm-hmm. and I thought, you know, I spent the last 20 years being an analyst, yeah. you know, exercising that the logical side of the brain. Why not do something very different? Why not try and be a little bit creative? Mm-hmm. So I went to that, loved it, um, set up my own company in London to, to develop scripts. And then found that I wanted to write something myself. So yeah. I wrote a script. Yeah. Uh, we turned it into a, a low-budget movie. Okay. Um, and that was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's extraordinary. Anyone who enters a film set for any time turns into a diva. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just get so emotional. Even you. I, I, yeah, this is what absolutely astonished me. I mean, everything is so pressurized. Everything is so focused on the moment. And, you know, the actors are trying to be as honest as they can. And that that affects the people around them. So it was the most emotional experience of my life. And I thought I was, you know, you know, cynical, old and hard boiled. But, you know, there I was (laughs) participating in all of this. And, you know, the movie itself, uh, did it work out exactly how I wanted? No. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a sense, it was, it was my, my film school. I worked with some great actors like Adrian Dunbar, David Suchet, Janet Agatha, a big, big uh, hero, heroine of mine when I was younger. And I was all set to do my second movie, uh, which I'm still working on. Man. <laughs> um, that name was Green. And it was a, a project set around St. St. Patrick's Day. Okay. Um, when another opportunity came from a different direction, and that, that was in politics. Okay. And you had done a bit of government advisory. That was your next thing, right? That was my next yeah. thing, yeah. Um, so I came back to Ireland. All of this time I'd been, been living in, 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 in the, uh, the UK. Yeah. So with wonderful, wonderful timing, I came back in 2006, you know, yeah. in other words, a That's year just before here everything. in Ireland, yeah. And I remember at the time saying to people, with a little bit of my banking hat on, I don't fully understand where the money is coming from for all of this. It doesn't quite make sense for me. Now, if I had followed up on that and bet on it, then, you know, they would have been making a movie called The Big Short about, about myself yeah. and my colleagues. <laughs> But of course, like an idiot, I, I asked a question and then likely moved on. Yeah. Um, and so then, you know, you had uh, the, the 2007 election and I'd, I'd been involved in politics as a young person. Um, wasn't involved in that at all. Um, but, uh, um, you know, had looked at what was happening in 2007 election. My past ex- uh, association was with Fine Gael. And basically... 
having looked at 2007 election, which honestly I thought Fine Gael should have won, mm-hmm. um, I had the temerity to write a couple of papers saying, here's how you can win the next election. Okay. And, you know, did I have any experience in that regard? The answer is absolutely no. So knowing that I knew nothing, which is the beginning of wisdom, the sage says, yes. right? Um, what I was able to do was I said, okay, I'm going to forget about what political strategists say. This is how you win elections or this is how voters vote. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the basics. I'm going to go back to the psychology. And there was a lot of work done that basically said that the common understanding of how voters vote is actually wrong. Mm -hmm. I summarized it in a few papers and there was some back and back and forward. And then it kind of went quiet. And I thought, fine. And then I was invited up to a meeting. I didn't actually know who I was going to meet. And I met... And the Kenny, gotcha. who became the Irish Taoiseach. And basically, he called my bluff and said, do you want to work for me in my office as political strategist? Wow. And what are you supposed to say? Yeah. <laughs> you, you're, you're Taoiseach put your, slash put your money Prime where your mouth is, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So again, you know, uh, was, was this, this planned? No, but... I think one of the secrets to life, you know, to the extent that I've learned anything is, as I say, is keep yourself open. Mm-hmm. I mean, an awful lot of what you hear these days is that, you know, life is all about the people who have the vision and, you know, follow it and, you know, are not going to be deterred, etc. That works for a small few. For most people, it's a disaster. Yeah. I think what you need to do is, is have a plan, um, but make sure that the plan is, is open. I, I, there was, you know, as I say, I'm a PhD in history. So one of the quotes I always liked, I think it was from President Eisenhower, who obviously had been uh, the chief of staff in the Second World War for the Allies, which was, you know, plans are nothing, planning is everything. Yeah. But as you go through, you do your planning. But if plan A doesn't work, you toss that out and you do plan B. Yeah, absolutely. I like to keep a, a few pots boiling myself. Exactly. You know, exactly. You know the direction you're going, but you got a few things boiling off to the side. People call it iron to the fire. I yeah, think bigger. Yeah. I like pots rather than yeah. you know, irons. And I think a lot of people who have the view that, you know, life passed them by or they didn't have the opportunities. I mean, that's certainly true. Uh, you know, certain people uh, um, are unlucky or they're born in the wrong circumstances. But I also think a lot of people um, have missed the opportunities that were available to them mm-hmm. um, because it's hard to keep your options open Yeah. because what you're doing, and I think this gets back to a lot of what an entrepreneur has, has to do, you have to get very comfortable living with uncertainty, mm-hmm. right? Big time. Absolutely. You you know it. Oh, yeah. You know it, Pia, and you know it, on right? You, you, you not only have to be comfortable with it, you almost have to dive into the swimming pool of uncertainty. Embrace it. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And I think you have to do a certain amount of that with your life. I mean, at at the risk of, you know, sounding like some some kind of an American guru, you know, in in a sense, we're we're kind of entrepreneurs for our own life, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, there are certain people who want, uh, you know, they they want the certainty, they want want the the plan, they want the 10-year plan, the 15-year plan. And as long as you're happy with that, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think most people want something a little bit more. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things I've, I've always believed that, that one of the big problems with, with our education systems and other education systems is that they don't prepare kids enough for that kind of life. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, there needs to be, I, I really benefited from an exchange program when I was in university. My sister did as well. Yeah. Um, and my younger sister. And I remember there was a point in time where it was probably after she had finished university, um, she was doing some traveling around the East Coast of the U.S. She had become a paddling, kayaking, nearly pro or pro, near, close to pro at one stage after her time in Galway. Yeah. Uh, um, and she just she had a chat with me once and said that um, being back in one place for her was very unsettling. Right. And that being unsettled and traveling around all over the place was almost her settled. 
Yeah. Right. And that things have reversed since then. She now has two kids and, you know, settled out near the West Coast of the U.S. But there, there's a strong element of that that I've always subscribed to is that that uncertainty is comforting in some crazy way. Um, and, you know, you, you need to find a way to maintain that. How, how long did you do the political advisory? That, uh, was, that, I, that was a number of years. Yeah. So I was, you know, I, I was in, in Ennis office for three years while we were in opposition. So, you know, come 2011, um, you know, the, the plan, the, there was a plan come out called the five point plan. So basically I, I had I'd written that and I'd written with with uh, as part of a team, I'd written the, the election strategy. And then we were into government. And I mean, big change. Yeah. So I became a, a government advisor for a while in health and then doing other things um, until 2014. Yeah. And then uh, Fine Gael set up a thing called the Collins Institute, mm -hmm. uh, which was basically a think tank. And the whole purpose of this was the problem with parties and government is that they get very institutionalized. And the idea of the think tank was that there would be a source of advice and policy coming in from the outside. So in a sense, in a curious way, I was, I was going back to some of my academic yeah. background, uh, taking, you know, trying to look for the big ideas. But having to take into account you're, you're living in a political world, so it has to make political sense as yeah. well. So basically, I, I continued in, 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 in the politics arena until, you know, the 2016 uh, election, and I left after that. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, had been, that had been eight years, an astonishing eight years because, you know, we were in the middle of effectively Troika government. Yeah. You saw from the inside just in what a terrible state Ireland was, you know, in significant extent from banking. Yeah. And that's one of the, the things yeah. that came up later on when we were talking about banking. And then you saw, you know, what was an extraordinary turnaround in a relatively short period of time. So, you know, I look back on the, on the time with, 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 with great fondness and, and, and great uh, pride. But after eight years, you know, you're a bit tired. It's time for new people to come in with a new approach. And so, again, 2016, it was it was time for me to look at something different. Okay, okay. And then it took you, sounds like, a couple of years to figure out what that something different was. Well, there was there was something in in the middle, and and it's it's still a little bit confidential, so I can't talk too much about it. But yeah. I I started working. I went. I picked up um, a little bit on the stuff I'd been doing in movies before. Mm -hmm. So I started working with a bunch of people in Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, and some some ex Apple people yeah. to to b build a business around around video streaming. Okay. Um, so that's that's kind of still ongoing. So there's, there's okay. not too much I need to say about that. Um, but um, uh, that was fascinating insight into both one how how big companies work. Yeah. And I was particularly interested in Apple because when I was in banking, uh, one of the companies I covered was Nokia. So Nokia, when I was covering it, you know, bestrode the world in mobile. Of course. And I was fascinated to try and work out how on earth did this computer company destroy yeah. <laughs> not only Nokia, but so many, many other players. And when you actually see a little bit of what you're doing, you begin to, to understand. And when you hear the stories about, uh, you know, Steve Jobs and what he did, um, you know, you, be, you, be, you begin to get a sense of why they became the, the biggest company in the world. So I did that for, for, for a couple of years. Um, and, but that was taking me um, uh, abroad quite a lot. And I wanted to spend more time in Ireland. And that's when this current opportunity this came current up. This opportunity came up. Um, you know, a, a very interesting career to date. Right. Well, interesting. I was in all over the <laughs> very, place. And, and, yes. and you kind of you, you start to think about it, right? Like, you know, someone who's been in uh, any given industry for, for 20 years or more, right? You know, a lot of that time it's like, well, I've been in a corporate type role for that long. But the first, you know, 10 years of or perhaps five or six years of what would have been your corporate career was in university in PhD program, right? And, Absolutely. And, and so you, you've had a different approach from the start. You kind of entered into the corporate world 
um, f- probably far more enriched than you know the average student, at least mentally rather than pocket wise. Uh, um, pocket wise, <laughs> definitely not. I, I owed my mom money. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know. It, it's something about confidence and, and having that ability at the age of 28 to, to make that leap and then making that call, hey, by 40, I'm done, right? And then it's what comes up next. Um, and, you know, you, you make the move into political advisory and then, okay, well, I've done that for 10 years or, or, or close to that, so let's move again. Do you, with understanding the definition of what an entrepreneur is, no matter how loose or broad that may be, is that something that you identify with at this stage? No, I mean, this, this is the thing, right? You know, I, I'm, I'm very reluctant to even use the word entrepreneur about myself because, um, yeah, I worked for most of my life in big institutions. Mm-hmm. So, so first it was university. Yeah. Um, then it was big investment banks. And yeah. Then it was, was government. So, you know, I'm, I'm not your classic entrepreneur you know there are people i've met and and they're extraordinary people you know who've known from the very beginning that they wanted to go out and you know build something themselves and be in control um that's not me I, you know I'm, I'm 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 almost like the accidental entrepreneur yeah but again it was a question of keeping open the options yeah. and so this this option in in la came up and it was a I wasn't. I wasn't in charge of that. I had certain functions, so it was a great stepping stone. Yeah, um, and that honestly began to whet the appetite, which was maybe there's something I could do where I would have a, a you know more of a, a leadership role mm-hmm. and could take some of this experience and put it to practical use. Okay. And do you think? Because you mentioned it earlier, and and it's a really interesting kind of thread on it around this kind of approach to your life as an entrepreneur, if you want to call it that term, whereby you have to kind of just be open to things going and sometimes pursuing things where they may not be part of your wider plan right now, but maybe it'll come back around. Because everything you've done, you know, you did a particular role, but like they've all added to each other in that sense. They have. I know looking back, you could probably explain how each one has added. But that's keeping your mind open to the fact that, well, actually, I've gone in this direction on the political side, but actually it still has helped long term in terms of what I'm doing now or whatever. So, yes. But but it seems that that requires to choose that mindset, to not like, you know, to keep yourself open to that, that that is a, a job in itself. It is. It is a job. And, and you, you know, very often you have to again, you, you have to swim against the tide. Mm-hmm. And, and the first uh, example of that was, you know, when I told, you know, people in Cambridge that I was thinking about, you know, moving over to finance. I mean, to say I hit a wall of disapproval. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, it it was set up. I was lucky enough to have gone there with a scholarship. And so, you know, uh, people had supported me through and, you know, the obvious next steps were the obvious next steps. So, you know, there was a a lot of this thing, you know, oh, you're going to go be a, you know, a merchant wanker kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And, and, you know, I would try and explain and I would just run into this wall of, yeah, of of flack. And academics are extraordinarily good at picking absolutely things apart. So I got I learned two lessons from that, which was um, one: don't try and explain, mm-hmm. because the people who uh, are doing what they're doing are committed to what they're doing, and, and a lot of people I think were genuinely puzzled. Yeah. Because for them, what they were doing was so enriching. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things I had to be careful of you to say, look, this is not in, in me in any way saying that what you're doing is not completely valid and terrific. And as I say, I, I regretted the fact that I felt like that because it's a great life if that's what you want. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, you have to make a decision uh, for yourself. And, and the second thing, thing I you know I did was uh, um, you know I learned that the best way to deal with a lot of this is is a sense of humor mm-hmm. so so a lot of the academics you know accused me in either politely or very unpolitely of selling out right so there was this idea you're going over to the dark side yeah. and I would try and explain no no I'm uh, doing this because 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 
And and I decided, okay, I, fun, I finally found the way to hit back. Yeah. So when they would say, you're going over to the dark side, I said, you're absolutely right, but you have no idea how much money they're paying. <laughs> now, for academics who are not on yeah. tr- tremendous salaries, um, that kind of stopped that conversation exactly. really quick, particularly when I would then follow up and say, can I buy you a drink? <laughs> um, no. You know, I'm not doing it for the money, and I've, I've actually never done it for the money, but it was the only way I could get out of those conversations. But it was likewise the, the, the same when I went from investment banking into the film industry. Yeah. So very much in the film industry, there's, there's the suits and there's the creatives. Mm-hmm. And actually, you know, while I might have seen myself as trying to be a creative for everyone else, I was a suit. And so I remember I, I had been asked at the British Independent Film Awards, I'd been asked uh, to give out the award for, for Best Movie. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the person introducing me um, mentioned, you know, a former investment banker. Okay. And literally the whole place started booing. Really? <laughs> oh, geez. Right? So, so I'm behind the curtains and... The introducer comes in and says, sorry. <laughs> so I've got to go out. And so I go out. And normally there's applause and yeah. there was silence. Oh, I thought, oh, my You God. got nothing. Nothing. I got nothing. So what would you say? So I, I didn't know quite to say. So what I did was, you know, I introduced the, 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 the contenders and, you know, they kind of play and, and then there's part of me thinking, oh, screw it. Yeah. So I got up and I was opening the envelope. And I thought, I'll do the same thing with them I did back in academia. So I said, I opened the envelope halfway and then I stopped. And I said, you know something? This is the most fun I've had opening an envelope since my last bonus check. <laughs> <laughs> now, there was loads of booing. But there was also applause. Yeah, right. That's right. Because they kind of thought, okay, yeah. and so so did the thing, and you know, so then afterwards, you know, people came up, and some people to tell me what a schmuck I was, and some yeah. people to say, but then the most interesting ones were the people who came up. Can we talk? Yeah, there you go. I've got an interesting project. Is there something we can we can do together? So again, you know, I think what it is is two things: is is you can't be deflected by what other people are telling you you should do. Mm-hmm. But likewise, don't take it to heart. Yeah. Have a sense of humor about it. And it took me a while to learn that. Yeah, no, you know? no, I get that. And, and whatever you do, do not, you know, do not, uh, you know, condescend to people who are still doing the thing they want to do. So I have friends who are still in investment banking yeah. and they have the best lives and they love what they're doing. Yeah. So the real question is, is not should you stay or should you go? The real question is, do you love what you're doing? Yeah. And, That's it. Yeah. And what's your risk appetite? Right. Exactly. And, and it, is it to, to go, you know, to go out there and have only perhaps three months of mortgage in front of you? Right. Um, at any one point in time. Or is it to say, well, listen, I've made some decisions here. Um, I know that I want to uh, be able to do X, Y, and Z on any given year and go away and take, you know, two weeks off and go to some island out in the West Pacific, yeah. right? But also what's, what's interesting, though, is that it's about the cycle of life, really, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I'm sounding like a, a Disney cartoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Lion King is coming but out it, But exactly. One. But it's, it's what may not make sense for you now may make sense for you in 10 years. You never know. So uh, could I have been doing 10 years ago what I'm doing now? The answer is probably not. Yeah, it's life experience this, as well. Yeah, yeah but this was, this, was the, this was the time. So I think what it is, is it's, 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 never, it's never too late. And again, if whatever makes sense for you at the time, as long as you're enjoying it, that's all that matters. But... Keep your eyes open to the the opportunity that comes from left field. Absolutely. You talked a couple minutes ago about swimming upstream. Um, yes. And with the code name of what you're working on right now being Project Salmon. Yeah. Um, you know, 
where you are right now with that, obviously in the next X number of months, um, there'll probably be some more noise out there on the market about what you're up to. But um, you've kind of mentioned already, um, you know, there's really no WeChat on this part of the world. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, are you at what point do you think you're going to be ready to kind of um, get out there into the market with with what you guys are up to? In, in a few months. In a few months. De- definitely, definitely this year. Um, how is it, how has it been holding back? Um, it's been very comfortable. Okay. Because I think um, I, I think in a sense, although what we're trying to do is very different, I'm actually old fashioned enough to think that before you announce, before you launch, you better have a really good plan together. Yeah. Right. You better have some of the essentials in place. You better have some of the people that you really need. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the dangers today, particularly with the app startup culture, right, is, you know, just fling it out there, see if it sticks. Yeah. And, you know, the Facebook's, you know, you know, mentality of, you know, you know, make it, break it and fix it. Um, that works for some companies, but I think people take it that it's the rule that, that works for all companies. I, as I say, perhaps because I'm I'm kind of older than than most most startups, founders and CEOs would be. I I want to have a plan in place. Um, I want to be in a situation when we launch that we have something we can be genuinely proud of and we can answer all the questions. So, you know, I've been, you know, as you say, very much under the the radar with this. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work um, in the background, and you know, all I can say is, you know. We had this idea about, about a year ago. Mm-hmm. Um, did I imagine then we could be as far as we are now? No. Yeah. And again, I think the really important thing to emphasize here is that, you know, and it's one of the things I think can be a little bit worrying when you focus on the entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no entrepreneur. There's a team, yeah. right? And we could not be where we are without the team. I'm, I'm good at some things, I'm terrible at other things. And I think the secret is to you know, be confident enough about what you think you can do. And I think I'm pretty good at strategy and I pr- think I'm pretty good at vision and stuff like that. Um, and I'm pretty decent with numbers. But I don't have huge operational experience. Mm-hmm. I've not worked, I've analyzed big techs, but I've not worked in the middle of them. I've not worked in a retail bank. So we have people inside who've worked in big tech, who've worked within banks, people who've had experience of setting up their own companies, some of which have worked, some of which they have failed. And I think, you know, if there's any secret source to what we're doing, it is that accumulation of experience and expertise of which I'm only a small part. Yeah. And that's an interesting view because we have like a lot of the founders we talk to, you know, they're they're kind of first challenge is giving over some of their baby, you know, because they've built it, whereby actually, you know, approaching it from a point of view that you recognize in what you don't know and bringing in those people as early as possible, you know, make, it's, a, it's a whole different approach to it in that sense. Yeah, and I think partly it becomes, again, you know, when, when you're a bit older and, and you've done a lot of things, I don't feel I need to prove myself. Yeah. All right. I desperately want this to work. But, you know, not so I can go around pounding my chest, just because I think it's a really cool idea and a whole bunch of people have put a lot of time in. But for me, the goal is twofold. One is the outcome. Mm -hmm. Um, And the second is to make sure that as we're working to that outcome, we're having some fun. Yeah. Right. It's one of the things one of the things I've learned, you know, particularly, you know, you know, the most precious thing actually is is time particularly personal time. And if you're giving up all this time for everything you do, there's something you haven't done. For every hour you spend on the business, and I know you know this, both of you, because you've got families, that's an hour you haven't spent with your family. Yeah. So it's not enough to say, I'm, I'm planning for the big payout or the big delivery in three, four, five years from now. Again, going back to the previous thing, what we're saying is if you're not enjoying it now, yeah. chances are it's not gonna work. And if the people you're working with are not enjoying it, chances are they're not going to stick but, around. But people know that you're enjoying it, right? They and, do. and people get inspiration yeah. and they feed off that. So, you know, 
I was talking to someone last week about this difference between the charismatic entrepreneur or founder, right? Yeah. Um, and the technical founder, right? Now, people can be both, right? But the, And probably saying technical founder probably isn't the right term. It's, it's that founder that keeps their head down, that just likes to solve problems and keep their head, you know, in the, it, it, down in the, in the bowels of things, more or less, right? Um, and then you have the charismatic founder that is, has some confidence about them and knows what they don't know um, and that they go look for help for people to build their team with, right? Yeah. Um, and I think there is a, you know, a, a charisma there, like I, like I said, that um, that breeds inspiration, that breeds some followership almost, um, and some loyalty, um, and some hey, let's get this let's get this done together that yeah. I can really subscribe. I, I to, think you know? you know, again, not wanting to do too many movie references, but yeah. it's 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 you know, it's a it's a fellowship. It is. Right, so it, uh, in this case, it's the fellowship of the app, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, one app to rule them all, all yeah. that kind of stuff. You know, this is there. There is there is there is nothing better than being with a group of people who who you you both like and you admire. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing better than you know, and it's happened a number of times where you know, you know, uh, you know. I would have an idea that we're going to go on this direction and people come in and say, there's a better way. And then you go through it and you go, great. And that's fantastic because you're kind of thinking, one, I've avoided this huge cul-de-sac. But two, these so talented individuals feel comfortable enough to come in and say no. Yeah. But not just no, because no is so easy. No, but here's a better way. Yeah. Right. So... The, the, the one kind of person I, I will not work with is the no sayer yeah. or the yes sayer, yeah. right? Neither are, are, are useful. But the person who says yes, but, or no, but, they're gold dust. And I like to think we have a few of them. Good, good. Well, this chat has gone in a direction that was somewhat expected, <laughs> um, knowing you, Sean, but somewhat, un, somewhat unexpected compared to... Um, the other 41 conversations we've had to date. Um, so, Owen, I'll kick it back over to you. Well, I know, because usually we'd ask at this point something that we wouldn't expect to know about you, but I'm, I'm kind of struggled to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> based on all, all I know about you now and that we've talked about here, is there anything people wouldn't expect to know about you? Oh, my Lord. Um, well, I suppose the, 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 the strangest thing I've done is, you know, we came back to Ireland to restore a castle. Wow. Okay, so, you know, um, if ever there was a decision that doesn't make financial sense, yeah. <laughs> that's it. And, and funnily enough, it was, it was something I always told myself I'd never do, you know. You know get, uh, 14th century or something? Uh, 15th century. So, yeah, so, yeah. so, so, so give, modern. Give take right? years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was an extraordinary thing we did. But what's really nice about that, you know, there's a number of things. One is, you know, I, I like to think that the community we're in, they feel a real sense of ownership of the place because, you know, so many of them, when they come see it, they talk about how their first kiss was in the, the ruins of the castle and they have all these stories and then there's folklore about the place. And um, if you look at the local school, you know, the badge now has a little painting of the, the castle on it and stuff like that. So that's been great. But also... Um, out of that, uh, my wife, who's, who's a medievalist and, and a, 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 an archaeologist herself, has now embarked on a whole series of work about, um, about the area, but now it's branched into medieval Connacht. And so a whole bunch of stuff came out of that. And then uh, my, my dad-in-law, who, who, who bought it originally back in the 70s when you, know, you, you could get these things for a penny, um, he actually was responsible for overseeing it. So I think one of the, the great things about it, and there were lots of bad things, believe me, <laughs> um, you know, take what you're thinking about, a bit like a startup, you know, triple the time, you know, <laughs> six topple the budget, if yeah, that's the right exactly. word. Um, but, you know, it was an extraordinary family endeavor. And, and we finally got there. And frankly, you know, when, when, we and Project Salmon is, is long forgotten. It'll still be there. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully a big salmon crest painted <laughs> high above the mantelpiece, right? 
All right. Well, thank you, Sean. Appreciate you coming on the show. No, and no. Uh, best of luck getting this thing off the ground. Thank you, guys. That wraps it up, folks. Thanks to Sean for opening up his mind to help us figure out why he does what he does. Remember, if you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, get in touch with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to Money Never Sleeps on iTunes and leave us a five-star review. You can also subscribe via our website to channels like Spotify and Stitcher, so just go to the subscribe page on moneyneversleeps.ie and follow the links. If you're searching directly on iTunes or Spotify, Money Never Sleeps is spelled as all one word. For more info and links, check out the show notes on moneyneversleeps.ie. You can drop us a line on info at moneyneversleeps.ie or at MNS Show on Twitter. As for me, I increase the odds of startup success. DM me on Twitter at Pete Townsend NV if you want to know more. And you can follow Owen on Twitter at Owen Fitzgerald9. Finally, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for recording and editing this podcast. Till next time, thanks for listening. See ya.